are with us. I want to start by going back to a comment that Dr. Esfeld made that USAID paid for gain-of-function research in China. And most people don't realize that um, because USAID won't give us the records. And we've been trying for over a year to get those records, which is why we're holding up one of their nominees uh, as well. So thank you for pointing that out, Dr. Esfeld. I'm going to go to Dr. Ebright next and talk a little bit more about EcoHealth Alliance, that they're about their record of noncompliance. Uh, they couldn't provide research records to NIH when NIH requested them. They didn't have an adequate agreement with WIV. They don't use the appropriate rate of pay for WIV researchers. Uh, there continue to be noncompliance with financial conflicts of interest policies. Dr. Ebright, based upon EcoHealth Alliance's record of noncompliance, should they continue to be eligible to receive federal funds? Their most important aspect of noncompliance was that they were informed by the NIH in terms and conditions on the notice of award for their grant that in the event they encountered viral growth in their engineered coronaviruses that exceeded the growth of the parent coronaviruses by more than a factor of 10, they must immediately inform NIH and immediately stop the research. They did not do this. So that's not merely a financial violation. That is a serious hazard violation and a violation that may be connected to the origins of the current pandemic. Uh, with that being said, uh, it is inexplicable that they were awarded subsequent federal awards and that they remain eligible to receive federal awards. Wow. I need to submit for the record. Thank you for the answer. A couple of articles. First, I, I quoted Dr. Fauci. This is a an article from Science, July 2012, a handsome young Dr. Fauci, so I want to submit that for the record. And my next two questions, I want to submit uh, something from the Wall Street Journal, a couple articles as well, uh, regarding genomic sequences. Without objection. So we'll go to uh, Dr. Quay next. You may be familiar with the genomic sequences in AIH's database, I think you spoke about them, that Chinese scientists asked to be removed and how they were uh, from early COVID uh, Wuhan patients. Do you believe there could have been more data in NIH's database submitted by Chinese scientists that could hold the key to the COVID-19 origins? Yeah, this was a really nice piece of work by Jesse Bloom at the University of Washington, who found uh, not in the NIH database, but on some Amazon web servers, uh, the actual sequences of viruses from very early patients that had been put on gene bank and then removed before they were published and made available. And the remarkable thing is, um, again, going to another piece of good research, the virus that first came out, the first one a virus, is three mutations away from what we now know is, is probably the first virus, but that's a computational method. It's, it's kind of complicated. But anyway, there's a prediction. There are three mutations that have never been seen in humans before the first virus that we have in humans. The specimens Jesse found had some of those. So we know that there are, that the Chinese have a, a vi viral sequences that are ancestral to what we have. And the more of those we get, the more we'll get to the, to the bottom of this. Uh, I'll point out that these sequences were from September and October of 2019, two months before any, uh, any person in the market was sick. So again, the, the timing of the market spillover uh, doesn't coincide with the genetics of the virus. Okay. Dr. Estel, anything to add to that? No, other than Jesse is certainly one of the foremost experts in this field. And if you want probably some of the best answers that science can give, then I would recommend that you request his input. Thank you. Uh, my last question. For 20 years, NIH sponsored EcoHealth's partnership with scientists from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The Chinese scientists have bragged that their virus sample database is the largest in the world. They took that database offline in September 2019. NIH asked EcoHealth for research records. EcoHealth told them that the records are in the custody of the Chinese government. Is it possible that the database taken offline by the Chinese government was data collected by EcoHealth and belongs to American taxpayers? Make sure they have speak. And Dr. Quay? Well, since, since the work has been funded in part by U.S. taxpayers, then by definition, uh, access to that would be important. And uh, I, I think, I also think that, that we don't have to rely on the Wound Institute of Virology from re releasing that. I believe within the U.S. jurisdiction, there will be copies of that database. It's too valuable not to have 
in your own possession if you're doing research on it. Do you think there's any way we can still get any of that data that's missing? I feel like, you know, somewhere we're going to find the grandfather of, of COVID or the, a cousin or something here in, in these data banks. Why, why did they take them down? And uh, I mean, what would be the advantage of them taking it down? Do you think we can ever find what we're missing? Well, it was taken down at 2 a.m. On, on September 12th, 2019, which is, I mean, I, I guess everyone works hard, but that's a little suspicious to be doing it at that point in time. I, I believe it contains closer precursors. And my, my hypothesis is it contains the one that's 50 mutations or 100 mutations, not 1,200 away. Um, and it was too obviously a, a smoking gun. But again, if you're collaborating on that and, and, and you're, you're spending 10 years building a database inside the Wilderness of Virology, you're going to mirror that database in your own facilities, which means that it's got to be at Equal Health Alliance somewhere. Thank you. Dr. Elstow, anything to add? Just note that I agree with Dr. Ebright's assessment from earlier. To the extent that China is doing this research, it's because it is scientifically sexy and glamorous and, get, and is fast, easy, publishable, et cetera. Okay. Chinese scientists have the same incentives as Western scientists in this regard. And I do not think, in fact, it's very clear that this research is not in China's strategic interest. China has no more interest than we do in handing out the blueprints to agents that can kill millions of people, including their people. This is not in the interest of any established powerful nation. And the question is, can we show leadership and persuade them of that? Because as long as we're doing it, we are making it, we are contributing to the fact that this is seen as glamorous research. It gets published in our top tier journals. Many Chinese scientists get bonuses for publishing in our top tier journals. We are driving these incentives because we persist in seeing this again as a health and safety issue rather than a national security issue. So I think it is in our power to change it. And I think this is one issue where our interests with are actually aligned with those of China and really indeed every other established nation. These are asymmetric tools of mass death. Wow. Okay. Dr. Ebright, anything we didn't ask you that we should have? Uh, that I don't know, but I did, just wanted to agree completely with the last remark by Dr. Esvel. Okay. Thank you, and I yield back. I want to thank everybody for being part of this hearing. I don't see this as the end. I see this as the beginning.